All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. With my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technological discovery you should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by my anonymous friend Lau. He's been a small business owner since he started working and has always been interested in getting the best value for his time with the least compromise. After he managed to own his own time, he started dedicating it to studying Bitcoin, socialism, and Austrian economics to try and understand where we all might be going in the future. I've already had many wonderful conversations with him in real life, and I'm happy to welcome him finally, I might say, on the podcast. So uh, welcome, Lau. Thank you, Bram. We're here. Yeah, we start, we start in Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> well... Um, yeah, like I said, I think we had lots of nice conversations. We, uh, we knew each other a bit from the internet and then we met in real life. And I think, uh, I don't know, first time we met, we talked for three hours or something about, uh, every, everything I might say. So I'm super excited to, to jump in. (laughs) Um, you sent me some thoughts and statements before a recording about, Econ- uh, economy, philosophy, your insights in life and Bitcoin. So I'd love to just go through them together in this episode. And I wanted to start with what um, your definition is of a paradigm and why you believe they are essential for exploring ideas, um, despite some of them not being true, right? I think that's a big thing in Bitcoin is I think you can factually learn how Bitcoin works. You know, that is uh, all out there. All that information is out there. But actually switching the paradigm that you adhere to consciously or unconsciously, like that's the biggest challenge for people. So I'd love to hear your your thoughts on that. I think uh, a paradigm is a is a structure that we can use in different ways. I, th- I think we can use it to understand a certain situation and how it uh, develops and um it is a uh, i think essential to understanding uh certain uh certain situations in life and how they um relate to one another and um i see it as a as as a framework and a construct that we are capable of creating that doesn't necessarily need to be true that we can use as a tool for uh, reaching ideas uh and insights that are helpful for for uh d- discovering truth uh, discovering how things could be um and sometimes you just need to sidestep truth to see um what isn't true so that you can determine where to go with your mind and I think a paradigm is very helpful in this in this sense. But you would agree that they are all created, right? I yes. Mean, I, I yes. actually wanted to ask, what is truth, right? What is? How, how do we know what is true? Isn't that always well subjective s- in a sense? Not necessarily. If uh, well, yeah, it 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 depends on what you start what you start with as the the basis of what what we are as 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 humans and what what knowledge really is um we, we can um uh go very deep and philosophical into uh whether a thought um or an idea really exists if if humans don't exist but given the situation that we're already <laughs> talking to each other um I think it's safe to assume that um, that thought is not ne- necessary for um, um, dis- discovering knowledge, discovering understanding. And yeah. Um, yeah, so a paradigm is a construct. It's 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 a, f- a framework that is designed by um, by people by thinking about thinking. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> but the danger there is that that uh, or danger. Well, yeah, maybe you call it the danger, but that a paradigm becomes an ideology, right? I mean, if we look at how you know for for the dimension of 
economics that touches Bitcoin. We live in a world where there's not really a challenge of the paradigm, the economic paradigm that we live in, right? And for lots of people that lead economics in our world, it it became more of an ideology than a continuous kind of like exploration of how can we improve, right? So I I think you mentioned something like ideologies are becoming uh, redundant. How how do you put that in? You know, view on economics, and then you know, especially your your angle comes from Austrian economics. Can you share a bit about that? Um, I think to use Austrian economics um, as a um, as a way to describe economics, you're looking for an epistemological basis for every thought you have about it. You want to. Um, at least verify with logic whatever you find to be to be true, and then incorporate it in um, how you can describe what a economy is. And um, I think Ludwig von Mises explains this perfectly in his book *Human Action*. And um, um, I think if you don't do this, then um, you create an ideology, and an ideology is uh, is something that is, uh, per, defin- per definition, not necessarily uh, true. It it, re- it actually requires some fiction, otherwise it isn't ideology. But uh, the danger isn't in um, there being an ideology. The danger is uh, in um, basing the uh, the outcome, the goal of your understanding, what you're looking for, basing it on uh, uh, on an ideology, because that becomes a bias then mm-hmm. for whatever happens after that. And um, I think this is what happened to modern economics and um, just uh, neglecting research done by other economists and um, um, I think by by that becoming an ideology and then um, uh, claiming it isn't also didn't really help achieving any uh, real understanding of the uh, of the actual reality that that a- economy is. Hey there! Thanks so much for listening to this episode. I just really want to ask you for a quick favor. Over the last few months, I've seen that only 75% of people who listen to this podcast or watch it on YouTube are actually subscribed. The most important thing I'm currently focusing on next to hopefully giving you interesting conversations is growing this podcast subscriber base so I can continue with it into the future. I want to thank everyone who has been viewing and listening to Bitcoin for Millennials, leaving comments here and sending me DMs. It's been super, super motivating. So thank you so much. So I really want to ask you to please hit the subscribe button on YouTube or follow me on your favorite podcasting app if you are enjoying this podcast. Thanks again for joining me on this journey. Now back to the conversation. Yeah, but like where we live in now, you see that based on certain ideology around economics, certain policy is created i would agree in a biased way right they they write the policy to eventually achieve you know basically only the one goal of the of the ideology they follow um but you've stated before and i love that that like uh, and i think that's from mises too right about human action that human action always adjusts and continues regardless of the policy right so these ideologues they create policy to influence human behavior but you state that the people will always find a way around it and how like i wanted to ask you like how do you how do you see that in the current state of economics like when now that i'm saying this i'm thinking about stuff like prohibition you know that's maybe a bit more classic right but there's always there's always people that do not adjust their behavior based on a certain rule, and there's people that do. So why um, 
why do you think there there will always be more people that will actually not adjust that the human action actually always trumps the policies um i think it it's just because human action is is a phenomenon and um if you change the conditions for that phenomenon um it doesn't it doesn't change the phenomenon itself it it changes the outcome of it so if you um uh, forbid somebody to do something then they're going to look for a way to achieve a better situation for themselves in a different way and they're going to look for the thing that isn't forbidden anymore or they're going to risk the th the 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 crime and that's what you see in the war on drugs but for example people take drugs there's no way to stop people from taking drugs one in four people in the, in the united states uses cocaine it's it's a given fact and they they will use cocaine no matter what the punishment is it, and um having a policy uh, like a ban on drugs i think it's idiotic because um you you don't change anything about the the desire of people and the and the economic choices that they make what you do create is is a, is a system uh, that allows criminality to exist if you want to get rid of the criminality then you you have to accept the fact that people take drugs and they desire to do so no matter what and i see uh, even easier policy and that is um, um to make money on uh drugs the the united states could potentially make um uh, a lot of money on taxing the industry but they mm. don't they spent a lot of public money on the war on drugs and it's just all wasted So why don't more people think like this? I'm thinking about you explained the paradigm, like uh, lots of people live in a paradigm or they follow a paradigm, right? That kind of helps them st structure their life and actions, etc. I think, you know, if you, if people listen to this now and they hear you say, well, people just use drugs, right? And I can imagine some people will say, yeah, about drugs, drugs are bad. I'm okay. <laughs> you know, like that. But <laughs> um, it's interesting because I, f I feel that, for example, with this, this topic, right, you can, well, you can feel like multiple things are true at the same time, right? Like, I agree, human, human action will, like, that will never go away, right? Like, the need of people to do what they, or the want of people to do what they want to do or circumvent certain rules created by just other people right like why would these other people know better than me what to do with my life like i agree with that but also i do agree with for example in, in the, let's say the drugs topic right if you completely legalize drugs there will be more people that do drugs and not everyone should do drugs you know like whatever what other well, drugs were you talking about well, do we do we know that for sure i, I mean that's a that's a that's a good reply i mean more like I don't know, kind of following this idea of like the fact that you can doesn't mean you should or something, right? Like, uh, and, are, and it kind of ties into how there are more side effects. How can you of, of the um, war on drugs? So, f for example, um, Ill illegal street drugs uh, uh, create a situation where somebody goes looking for weed and they they go to a street dealer. The street dealer doesn't only have uh, weed in his pocket; he also has some fentanyl. He also has some uh, uh, oxycotton he also has some some uh, ghb whatever uh, whatever the dealer carries is for sale and um uh, people who um are tempted to try different things um will eventually try it sooner under the influence of an illegal dealer who is just there to to uh scam them out of out of money I mean, the ethics of a street dealer is uh, pretty questionable. So um, the the side effect of street dealing is uh, hazardous to the to the user of the drugs. And this is this is one of the reasons that in the in the 
uh, late 70s and early 80s in the Netherlands, coffee shops became um, allowed. And um, th this is because the, the, the guys who went to Nepal and came back with a big slap of, um, uh, of hash, they also had uh, heroin. And um, it kind of looks the same. So they would just sell it in the streets to whoever uses wanted to buy it and this is this is how heroin became uh popular as a as a drug as a rec recreational drug in in those days and um there were dealers who did have a, a uh, an idea how to conduct this more safely and they just started talk talking with uh, the governing bodies about um, potentially creating shops that would just sell weed because mm -hmm. weed is sort of harmless and uh, and hushies and um, um, because it's just THC and some CBD and um, and it's it's not as uh, impactful on your health and on your on on your men mental health and your further productivity as uh, uh, heroin is. So the course that the Dutch government took with that by allowing it and, and working together with people who sell drugs um, to at least allow uh, weed and hushies, I think is a very sane reaction to um, the availability of, of, of um, several kinds of drugs that had extremely different outcomes on, on behavior of people. Um, and, um, I think people aren't looking to use heroin per se, uh, but if they are tempted to, then there is a, a higher chance of them actually trying it. And of course it's, it's pretty addictive. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about where to where to go with this. I think I started this with like, you know, multiple things can be true because now that you're talking, I think about, you know, like, of course, alcohol is legalized. And I mean, we could have a conversation about that alcohol is probably worse than smoking weed from, from time to time, right? But it's just so normalized that, um, you know, and there's a lobby, of course. So if 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 there would be like a complete legalization of drugs, there would be some sort of lobby fight with the alcohol industry and tobacco for sure. Um, so, and, and as you said, like not, people are not necessarily looking for heroin, et cetera, but I feel like it's kind of, and that's why I talked about the, the paradigm part. Like you, you just said in the beginning, you know, paradigms are essential for exploring ideas. Right. But if you, if, if you want to explore ideas, doesn't mean you can, right like you have to be able to open your mind to a certain degree um and park some of the thoughts uh, or the beliefs you have in order to also explore new ideas right and i in, in my opinion that's a very conscious um action right you you consciously search for things that challenge your beliefs and thoughts to see what you can learn from that and i don't i i think that not everyone can do that, which is okay, right? But then, um, you know, if you would open up for, uh, for example, like all the drugs <laughs> to to just be bought legally, that's kind of my point. More like I don't think everyone can actually be responsible. Responsible, but perhaps this is also um, uh, something we we touch up we touch upon later. But I feel like it's kind of you know the taking the responsibility to consciously think about what do I spend my time on or what drugs do I want to take or which book do I want to read i I don't think that's very different from um each other. Does that make sense like mm -hmm. what what you do basically what what you spend your time on or what action you take so that's why I said like multiple things can be true at the same time like I agree with uh less policy and let people just do it but there is peop there are people that cannot handle that responsibility. Well, I think in the in in understanding human action what that means is um you have to make 
the decision to, to you have to make the sane deci- decision to stick to sanity and to understand that if you want to implement a policy, you you need also to have an uh, you have to create a policy that is enforceable. It, you can't I agree. you can't uh, implement a, a policy that isn't enforceable. It's just not it's it, it's insane. Hmm. So it, as soon as you discover that something is not enforceable, you need to stop with the policy, and then you need to figure something out, uh, else out, and and you can find uh, something. Maybe there is a policy with drugs that does work, but prohibition in this case has turned out to be a complete disaster. I mean, an utter disaster. For, out of uh, all my uh, American friends, um, uh, everybody I know in in the states, and this is hundreds of people. Everybody they, uh, out of everybody they know, there are people who died from overdoses mm-hmm. and for me as a dutch guy this is unheard of i don't know anybody in the netherlands who has od'd on anything at all i agree me me neither <laughs> no yeah so it's it's just completely nuts yeah i think that's a great illustration by the way where um i mean i think the the drug laws in the netherlands are are flawed right it's like a real dutch solution to this like how they approach it now but it's still better than total crackdown um on it i agree um that that's already what you see with uh with this illustration of do you know anyone who od'd and died like yeah i I don't know anyone either so i think i think that's a fair point so um when you talk about or when people in bitcoin especially you know talk about austrian economics how how does the approach in austrian economics um help us in understanding like those limitations of policy that you just mentioned i mean you, you uh read ma- way more about this than than i did but i'd love to um get like an insight on how how does austrian economics approach this specific part well it, it explains a lot about what what is going wrong and um it it also explains how how to fix it but uh, that's only through a hard money st- standard and that's the reason why I, I became so interested in it i i got bitten by the bitcoin bug hard as um, uh, many many of us were and um i th- i thought there has to be some way to understand um more b- more about the consequences of bitcoin and um i think much uh, good has been been said about this. I, I recently read uh, Newt van Holm's uh, Praxi- Praxiology. It was a really good uh, um, book. It's a very, very good uh, introduction to uh, hu- human action. To um, I mean, Praxiology, human action. Um, um, but I th- I think not many. People who own Bitcoin currently are aware of the of the topic and the and the broader consequences of it. How the incentives of uh, of people change on a on a different money standard, and it is being hammered on constantly. But I still think, by the way, people react to one another on Noster, for example, uh, in, in exchange of messages, there's, there's still too much sticking to the old mentality of um, having a, a high time preference and not understanding that you can, you can now finally let go. Um, so what's the core of that, you'd say? Like, what's the thing that people don't? understand then yet i think that that they're still selling their time Hmm. and because they're still selling their time in a way that is eroded by the system that's paying them out uh, they they don't open their eyes for uh, the the thing they should be really doing and uh, many many are doing it, or or halfway doing it, or or for ninety percent doing it, but 
still s- lots of the old paradigm lingers in in the minds of of many bitcoiners still and i think it's just a matter of time that this this just evolves towards a better understanding of how to spend time efficiently and um um how to really master time preference to uh make yeah make because better- I, that's what i actually wanted to say i think if 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 you would want more people to move into this harder money right quicker then that is of course a sign of high time preference right we cannot um i i think this is an interesting subject because i think especially on twitter and i know twitter especially for us or noster you know it's a real bubble we are at the forefront of of this new thing but i feel lots of people expect way too much in way too little time right they they want so many things to happen in a short period um uh of time uh, right their expectations are 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 way too high and i think we cannot expect me people to to move to this new money very quickly in whatever way, way right like whether you sell your fiat currency for bitcoin or you start taking a job in bitcoin or selling your product products or services in bitcoin wh- whatever that is for for someone right um it, it it just takes time and i don't know how that is for you but i feel like uh that is also part of the personal challenge for us like we already see this and we want this to exist and we know that a world on a hard money will become super abundant and people will actually do what they would what they would love to do right in terms of job or com- or ventures or or whatever um but it just doesn't change this fast because the paradigm that we're battling <laughs> right is very strong and most people don't actually realize that they are operating in a certain system that they just don't understand. So, yeah, I just feel like we should also temper our own time preference in that sense. Mm -hmm. I think it's also because even though Bitcoiners focus on the cyclical nature of Bitcoin all the time, they just do it to watch price action. And Mm. um, all the models are uh, about price action. And I think price action is is interesting because it shows um, what you then can do with it. And I think the the, the cyclical, cyclical nature of Bitcoin that I'm that I'm now mostly interested in is what capital capital is freed by the price action of Bitcoin. So with every cycle, the price goes up, and then the budget of people, us Bitcoiners, becomes enormous. So imagine going from having invested a uh, hundred thousand in, in in Bitcoin uh, a couple of years ago, and um, and then by that owning uh, twenty twenty Bitcoin, you now have more than twenty. You have now more than ten times as as much, and um, all this all this money is now giving you a feeling of safety, and uh, you're just smiling all day. And this is this is real capital. It's real money. This is not this is not something that you became owner of because you leveraged into de- debt. So it's not like you own twenty houses, and um, only a percentage of that is is yours. And um, your stream of income pays uh, somebody else's stream of income. No, this is Bitcoin. It's it's true. It's uh, hardness. And uh, it's it's in your possession, and you can do with it what you what you want. But now, fast f- fast forward another cycle, and it it ten x again. Then all of a sudden, your lifestyle changes because you now no longer need to work. You have you have fifteen fifteen million, and you don't know what to spend it on. But you do have um, uh, ideals, not. You're you're not an ideologue. You have come to see that Bitcoin really works. You're an idealist. You you understand the the value propositions of Bitcoin, and now with that you can also invest back into Bitcoin, and you have every incentive to do so. And what is your budget? It's it's literally the, the magic internet money. 
And yeah. now because you have fifteen million dollars, you have five five million to spend without mm -hmm. there a need to be a return because the return is already in in the bitcoin that you have it's already it's already that valuable so this happens every cycle and uh, the the people who are in bitcoin now for and, and have been for a long time they have every incentive to invest back into bitcoin you see this with uh, with jeff booth coming to the re realization that um, he is holding on to to something which is not just an idea not just not just the wealth that it that it brought but but it's a it's a holistic thing too bitcoin gave him a certain freedom and uh, he wants to give back to the community also and yeah. you see that he s starts to spend his time in a certain way so that as he calls it himself he is no longer an hip uh, a hypocrite he is contributing to the development of bitcoin in the in the in the way he thinks is best and when we were at uh, bitcoin atlantis in madeira uh, we saw michael saylor uh, in his speech and he announced there to the public that um um MicroStrategy is no longer just a Bitcoin investment company. It's a Bitcoin development company. And the reason that he says this is that, is that he has every incentive to in invest capital into Bitcoin de development because the more he makes the e ecosystem, who more the more value he creates for the ecosystem, the more it also returns to the value that he holds. Yeah. So a certain fall off percentage of acquired wealth can go to uh, just distributing it to to people who are building for him, creating creating a better ecosystem. And he doesn't even need to own it because everything that happens in the ecosystem is better better for him. So he's every every incentive to to give give a loan to a certain small company, a startup that that is go, is developing. Uh, e-cash on bitcoin or uh, uh, a, a new a new kind of wallet that does some something that is just uh, more uh, seamless in uh, integration or what whatever whatever you mm. can think of or a mining company for that matter yeah i think there's also a really big shift in you know fiat economy or fiat world is kind of like a zero sum game, right? When I win, you lose. And a, a Bitcoin world is a mutually beneficial game, basically. So, um, exactly like you like you said, right? Like we any, both anyone, play. We both yeah, win. Yeah, we both play. Yeah, exactly. And um, th that's also sometimes what I see when I try to like bears true like neg negative views on bitcoin right people think it's too good to be true <laughs> basically right like that they in a sense can save themselves right or actually build towards the future or um, um be that lucky that we are living at this moment and in time where a new money is being monetized that you know that 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 can actually be given to you in some sense right and i think i talked about this a lot before but i think the, the conversation i had with eric Kaysen really stands out like it's a very nihilistic world view right the the zero sum game type thing like mm -hmm. that um it's very negative like very very uh very negative and also it it doesn't give people um of course, because it's, it's nihilistic, but like a, a, a positive outlook on the future. I don't, I, I, to be honest, I don't know a lot of people, especially outside of the Bitcoiners I know, that have a really positive outlook on the, on the future. You know, like it's pretty nihilistic. I, and I shared this, I think, a few episodes back, but like I talked to a guy our age, super smart guy, CTO of a company. And he uh, totally understood like all the flaws of fiat money, understands how Bitcoin works, but he still thinks it's not going to work. 
you know, because it will be corrupted or whatever. And then I asked him like, hey, do you have children? And he said, no, this is also the reason I don't have children. And it was really like the first time I had like a one-on-one -on -one personal conversation with someone. Like I know these thoughts exist, you know, like people, some people think this, but like that was really the first time I had personal contact with someone who actually saw the world like that. And it just, it really hit me. Like I thought it was so... um sad in a way and i also asked him like uh you know with with all due respect but like like does this mean you gave up like is this just it and then he said yeah <laughs> i just i don't know yeah. i couldn't wrap my head around it it's so far away from how i uh view the world like i'm realistic in what's going on but i'm and and that is not very positive right but i I do have a positive outlook towards the future, but that's probably because I understand or see Bitcoin. I think that's the main reason, but I don't know. It's just hard to see that in other people, especially like our age, like same, you know, like a millennial age. Um, yeah, you're really building out your life and then this is your outlook. I don't know, like, what, what, do you see this too? Or what, what, what are your thoughts there? Well, I'm, I'm an optimist, and um, I would have never given up. But I have encountered people who are less optimistic than I am, and I think I'm more than average optimist. But um, I think it's it it has to do more with people's uh, uh, individual traits and whether they adhere to a positive world view. Um, I know mankind is uh, is not doomed um, to fail as a as a as a product of this uni universe wanting to get to know itself uh, through our eyes, and um, um, that's that's uh, something that I see because be because I see what people choose to do. And um, I, I see the good more than the bad. But um, my my father was a, a nihilist, and um, he he tried to battle it by um, becoming a supporter of of policies. And this is also why why I'm so adamant about this. Uh, he. he believed he truly believed in globalism for the better of mankind and uh and just uh coercion towards teaching people to make better decisions and um i i knew this this was wrong even before i understood what bitcoin could do um but yeah i'll i will always have a positive uh, view of the future just because yeah. of how I how I see the world and what kind of person I am it's interesting when you share that I think like that that is already a pretty nihilistic thought right like teach other people how it should be done <laughs> it's actually yeah it's, it's actually very negative but but it does tie in with what I said before like I don't think everyone can make the right decision right when it comes to drugs so there you know, if I reflect on myself, I think there's also a bit of that in there when I said it, kind of disguised as something that sounds caring. Interesting. I don't know. I'm just reflecting uh, reflecting on that. But yeah, like I, 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 I agree. I have to think about that for myself. But I agree with, you know, if you think like, oh, I know how this works and I'm going to write and support policy to coerce other people into changing their behavior like that sounds horrible actually actually because what gives other people third you know third parties the authority to influence your life decisions which is basically what do you spend your time on right or what do you spend your mind energy your mental energy um men mental energy on but like how do you think like how how did we get here i also wanted to ask you about um you know, like LSD experience, like insights into how how you view life. You just mentioned 
about the universe. Uh, what you sent to me is the universe is a self-aware, is self-aware through our perception. I love that. But like, how how did that help you understand basically life or what what people do in their life? Well, before I ever took LSD, I uh, I studied uh, cognitive science and learning about the uh, the functions of our brain and um, uh, trying to understand what uh, brain activity is, what consciousness is, what learning is, um, gave me a, um, a broad basis for what uh, for understanding what LSD does to your mind. And um, what LSD then um, uh, showed me was that actually everything is vibrations. And um, um, our, our brain uh, perceives only vibrations. And enhancing this perception to become more sensitive to these vibrations and their resonances, their their interference they cre they create to see all those patterns where interference is their synergy of uh, of waves um, is gave me the understanding that that if this is all we can perceive then that is our that that's the only thing we'll learn about our reality and and um, um maybe you, you can have more insights about what the what our reality is but y you the the basis of it is that everything is is vibrations because that's all we can perceive and um one of the things that i that I concluded from that also is that if um, if you want to know what um, what time is, you have to understand how we perceive and time isn't something that we perceive. We have memories, we have retention of everything it hap that happens, and we do this chronologically. And this um, is through, through retention. And per perceiving memories is actually the creating the perception of time. Interesting. Yeah, I like to. I like I like to think about the concept of time because everything was always now, right? Just like the memory. The memory at that moment when it happened was was the now. But when you package it in a memory, you and you and you and, and like you said, you you put it in in time. I think it kind of distorts it also distorts uh, distorts 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 it also um in a sense what um what are like the things that you took away from those experiences like how how did you integrate them into your life or your current views on economics for example um or your work I don't well I don't know how it, um, how this integrates with uh, ec economics necessarily but or like the human action that we talked about I think um we have certain ideas uh about what facts are and many of them aren't really facts at all people just um tend to believe a certain consensus 
and um, people are susceptible to this and they create a reality or a worldview that's based on this ideology that they build together. And um, I'm, uh, I'm just not, I'm never going to stop there. I'm, I'm never going to accept a certain way things are um, um, just because people who call themselves experts uh, uh, say that it is so. I will always want to know what the background is for this knowledge to want to exist in books. I'll always ask questions about it. I'll always want to scrutinize the the ideas and and um, what I'm searching for is the is the bias behind it. Most most ideas uh, have uh, a researcher's bias, and um, um, I think it's important for anyone who wants to understand anything uh, to realize that ev everything is biased all the time and you have to, you have to keep looking for the for this phenomenon in in your work in your thoughts and lsd helps to pull you out of fixations of ideas and show you something that is completely different uh, for me, it really felt as though I was finally out of the fishbowl. I had been swimming around perfectly happy in this fishbowl, and I had my plants and my 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 gravel, and um, I saw I saw the glass, and I thought oh, it's it's marvelous. There 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 must be something something out there, and I took LSD, and for the first time, I I held the the fishbowl in my hands, mm. and. Um, uh this this is also why i encourage people to be interested in this if even though that uh, not everybody is uh, not everybody should do it it's still something to be careful with um most people don't really um take it well when they have um memory impairment and this is this is something that people think is very very uh scary most of the time if you take a lot of lsd or or psilocybin there's a there's a possibility that you you become memory impaired and you lose all sense of time and the trip just ten, is perceived to last forever yeah. because because your function of memory fails then your sense of time fails and then um, uh, you're you're stuck in a sort of a, a hole and if you don't know yourself well enough and you have some demons. That, that have been haunting you, even though you've never really uh, met them or acknowledged them, then you can you can be in for a very painful trip. But yeah. it ends, and uh, people can get over those traumas and uh, try try again. And I think that most people will have a good time and uh, really learn beautiful things about themselves, about reality, even if they just do it recre recreationally. I've never considered taking LSD as a recreational phenomenon. Um, I've I've always done it with um, spirituality in mind, with uh, self development in mind. I've always set this uh, intention, and I think set and setting in in uh, in LSD the way there um, you can be conscious of what you get into and what circumstances you are under matters matters a lot. Um, I think yeah. Paul, Paul Stamets talks a lot about that. Yeah, Michael Michael Pollan. Um, I read his book, and um, I think he summarized it well. Also, yeah, yeah, I love the fishbowl example. I think what you eventually learn is that um, you are not the subject; you are the observer watching the subject, basically, and that. You know, if you can look at the fishbowl, that you, what you think is you, right? Your your body and your name and where you're from and all these things, you know, that is what we ascribe as to the you or what you are. But if you are the observer, the self, then you observe what what is the subject. And then once you realize that... um. You know, I, I, I love the example of, you know, if the voice in your head is talking, then who is listening, right? You are not talking and listening mm -hmm. at, the, at the same time. You are listening to the voice. You are the listener. You're the observer. Um, 
but yeah, I agree. I think I think that takes work to kind of like get there and be open for that. But I was also thinking when you talk about talked about consensus, right? Like the consensus is also in a sense the bias, right? If you agree mm-hmm. with a consensus without scrutinizing it in a way, right? Or researching it in a way or questioning it in a way and you just follow it, which is the easiest easiest thing to do basically. Because, you know, when you scrutinize a consensus, you also scrutinize your own thoughts and beliefs about something. And that, um, that is hard for a lot of people. Um, That's yeah, the I think... problem I have with the, the mechanist materialist paradigm that is uh, currently the bias in science. It's just blinding scientists to open their eyes to what I think is a, a far more encompassing and uh, understanding uh, paradigm, which is the acoustic paradigm. I mm. see myself and my, my central nervous system as an acoustic instrument. And uh, with that, I have a, 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 a paradigm that is extremely different, that diverges from, from the mechanistic paradigm that yeah. allows to understand certain phenomena. For example, um, a uh, placebo effect is something that is um is you can't explain it with the mechanist paradigm and also the integration of uh uh what what string th- theory is trying to do the integration of uh, all phys- uh, all physics laws into into one encompassing uh, um, uh theory i think it's impossible from the mechanistic paradigm and i i think uh um the problem with the mechanist paradigm is, for example, this is something that Rupert Sheldrake uh, has has written a lot about. He's dedicated his life to this, and and uh, I think it's it's beautiful the way he describes it. That the um, um, the mechanist paradigm is um, um, determining for science that uh, nature itself and the laws of nature are are, are fixed and uh, can't evolve also. And just assuming this for whatever uh, science discovers through research is just such a short-minded vision of what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. Because what you're trying to accomplish is, tr- is not to rule out where you're, wh- what you're going to find out. You need to have a framework that allows for more possibilities because the, the the you don't know what the outcome of your research is you have to you have to have uh, an as an as open an eye as possible mm. to uh to also be able to recognize when you have discovered something i'm yeah, reading 100%. i'm reading I, this book by gary Gary Klein now, and he he calls it he calls it stacks stacks of ideas that lead to the discovery of new new ideas. I kind mm. of like that. In a sense, this this is this, the rabbit hole I'm in now. I'm, I'm I'm finding out more about Bitcoin mining, and I'm I I spoke to somebody who works in uh, in the power sector, and um, uh, that person said that. 20, 20 gigawatts of power, which is the total mining capacity of uh, of the world of, of of all of Bitcoin mining, is um, um, minute. She called it um, compared to compared, all the energy consumption. Yeah, but n- not just that. Uh, um, w- compared to what a typical energy company has in consumption. Hmm. Yeah, and. At first, it, it kind of scared me, but then I and then I realized something that I now, with Gary Klein's idea of stacks, can uh, can sort of um, articulate better. Um, Bitcoin is already a niche. There are very few people who understand Bitcoin, and um, once you do, you become adamant, and uh, um, you start explaining it to people and to yourself uh, better and better. But then there's Bitcoin mining, and that's the niche within the niche. 
And there are very few Bitcoiners who understand what a, an opportunity it is to be in mining and also what kind of responsibility it brings. And I see it as the, the responsibility to, to revolutionize the energy sector because the energy, energy sector, sector is one of the most wasteful, wasteful industries, one of the most wasteful products of mankind ever to just, because of uh, low demand, just throw away uh, um, a, a large percentage of your production just because there's there's no incentive and and no no we no way to fix this inefficiency and bitcoin bitcoin mining f- really does fix this inefficiency yeah what but i yeah. love about this sorry like when you say about stacking ideas i think it does come from kind of like first principle type thinking or i think it's also a bit spiritual in a sense like uh, like for me, I at one point just adopted, I saw someone say like, once you know that you don't know everything, right, then the world opens up, you know, mm. it's and, and kind of like combined with, you know, everybody's winging it and nobody knows what they're doing. <laughs> like that is really true, right? <laughs> we are all trying to figure it out out whatever it is right like how however you however you define it and i and and i don't, i i still try to wrap my head around what what is that right because I, it is actually it's also human action it's 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 something yeah, but that... it's a hard decision it's a hard decision because if the world opens up right that's a lot of information <laughs> that's a lot of things to think about right that's a lot of things to consider to constantly um i think it's also one of the things you sent to me right but like you know sometimes you have rational thoughts you have ideas but you're always open like you're never married to them because you know that you don't know everything right and you and i also we we enjoy doing that it's enjoyable right and it gives us a certain energy and uh, fulfillment in a sense um but lots of people are not like this and um not to criticize not at all but it's just like not not a lot of people are like are, are like that and these are the people that um yeah basically get abused or they get put in this paradigm right or they agree but- with the consensus and then they you know never have to think again um maybe that's a bit short-sighted but like they don't have to think for themselves right other people think think for them and when you were talking about science one of the things i had to think about and i loved that um i heard um bernardo you know bernardo kastrup no i think he is a physicist but also like i don't know if it's into string theory or whatever but he had he studied like uh, uh atoms and eventually i i heard a interview with him but he ended up at um same conclusion as that you know eastern f- philosophers already ended up you know like everything has a consciousness everything is conscious etc et but he talked about like how si- how science is conducted that it's it's a bit flawed because uh, and he used this term like we follow observation is creation and then he had the example of darwin sitting on his boat you know he's observing I don't know, certain types of birds, whatever, for two weeks, and he sees what they do. And then he creates um, a law, a nature law or a model, you know, like uh, this theory. guide. Yeah, theory. He talks about, you know, we know a lot of um, laws of nature, but we don't know why they exist like that and the why they exist like that is a way more interesting question than just stating what you have observed right like okay but why is it like that i'm always you know i have this plant in the background like i and i just got like a new leaf i'm always fascinated like how does the plant know how it should grow (laughs) you know like it's weird so i can observe the plant and how it grows but it's still like why how, how how was this plant programmed to grow like this, like how the, I don't know if you see it on the video of people are watching, but it's like this Strelitzia big plant, 
and you have like a huge leaf, almost a meter, and it's all like all rolled up and it grows and then, you know, it opens up and I'm with every leaf, I'm just fascinated, like how, how does this work? Right. And this is kind of what he talks about. Like we can be like, oh, the, this plant grows like this. Yeah. But the question is why, you know, and the why is definitely not answered and we don't know anything about the why, not a, not a lot. Right. And well, that, so he oh, talks that's, about yeah. That's, yeah, that's also because the the why is from reason, and reason is hum it's a it's a human phenomenon, and we don't know whether the universe itself also reasons. We it's an assumption, yeah, exactly. But yeah. it's an assumption either either way. So if if the if if the if the universe and all all matter in the universe uh, has purpose or not, uh, if you decide either one is true for for your work then uh that uh, uh that sets it and then um you're limiting yourself so um i th i think a why question is is Fair point. is interesting but i think the um if if you if you notice that you can't really answer it truth truthfully or if if you can't really find something that's meaningful about asking the why why question the how question is also interesting and um and just to understand the phenomenon from a from a different viewpoint instead of reason just just to be able to observe without evaluation and um uh, to try to connect uh, everything that is happening, and to understand the the process from uh, what it what it produces, and and then later you can you can bring the why question back again, and then and then see oh oh so maybe the process was way longer than I thought, and and now now I'm I might be able to answer the the why question too. Yeah, good point. I th I think. What I tried to say was more like the if we end on the consensus of you know this is a nature's law, whatever, then we also like stop thinking further, right, and I think that's what I liked in his point is just like, okay, you can mm -hmm. identify how something works, but not why it works like that, right, so you cannot be so rigid as some people are about saying something like this is how x y z works and that is just it right that that cannot be that cannot be the consensus because there's there's something behind that as to the why and you don't necessarily have to answer the why i agree but if you can agree that that stated truth or that stated consensus is not the the final understanding that's when you keep an open mind to to keep exploring you know whatever could be different in not only information but also you know the actions that that you can take in you know whatever um uh whatever whatever context but that that's also something i wanted to ask you about i like that you describe bitcoin as human potential energy can you expand on the metaphor? Like how uh, how can people understand what you mean with that? Well, I, I heard somebody say Bitcoin is stored energy, and I thought, no, that's uh, that's that's wrong because you can take that literally. It is a human potential energy, is because that that is exactly what it represents. You can exchange it for you. You can you can exchange it for somebody doing something for you. And you can describe what value that has for 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 you, or somebody else can do it and can describe it, and then you find you find it as a as a payment. You it it becomes the representation of uh, of of human energy, and I like to say it, it's a it's human potential energy because it it's also all the energy that hasn't been spent yet. So you have in your, uh, uh, but with the Bitcoin you own, you have something that you can exchange for uh, something that needs to happen in the future. Yeah. So it's it's a potential. Well, it's basically what money should be. 
exactly yeah yeah but I, uh, I I agree with it. I think it is when I own it, it's like human potential energy. Um, I talked about this uh, before, but like I, I once heard like everything you see around you, um, at like literally everything you see, like costs energy to create or maintain either by other people, you know, or I'm looking at a tree, you know, that's the sun. Um, the water, etc. Right, like everything costs energy to create. But um, and so, like I, that's kind of how I see, you know, with money, the exchange between two parties. If I do something for you, and you give me, you know, quote unquote, money in return, the energy that I expended, you know, in the exchange that uh, that that we have. Well, uh, you built houses before, right? So you know, if you build a house and you use wood. And you expend your time and energy, and I pay you in, you know, wh whatever the money is. Then it is stored energy, right? At that moment, I do see it as stored energy. Well, or it was my, uh, you know, um, how do you say? Uh, what did you say? The uh, human potential energy that I'm giving, I'm giving to you. Um, so yeah, I, li I like human potential energy or stored energy, but that is what it actually should be. Right, because then when I when you receive that money, and you want to spend it on something else, on on anything else that costs energy to create or maintain, um, then that is what actually money should be, at least in my uh, understanding, or well, maybe it's opinion, but I think we agree <laughs> on on that. <laughs> Let's call it an opinion, <laughs> but uh, because definitely not everyone agrees in this world. Um, but yeah, it's just that, right? It's exchanging energy all the time, and it and at the moment that we make an exchange, you say, you know, it takes uh, two months to build a house, and uh, these these are the materials I'm going to use, etc. It's X amount of units of X Y Z money. Then at that moment, we have an equal exchange, and it's it should stay equal, right? Because you put all the energy in the house, and I should reward you in money that also represents that same amount of energy and that it keeps that amount of energy towards the future for whenever you want to spend it on other yeah. human potential. Yeah. And that's and that's why real estate isn't money and gold is gold doesn't have a uh upkeep and a house has a upkeep. Yeah. So if you exchange money for a house then you're not getting human potential energy. You've you've you you get hum, human uh, spent energy. Well, or your house leaked energy if something broke that was built before. Yeah. Then yeah. it kind of leaked energy, and you have to yeah. to put that that energy back, basically. Yeah. yeah. So how how do you think you know your view on Bitcoin? How 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 does it? What what are the implications on how it can change? the economy compared to how we use well the money that we are forced to use now well um i think what uh, isn't being talked about enough is efficiency and i i want to change that i want to start a mining company and talk about e efficiency efficiency is one of the th one of my uh, focal focal points in in life and i've noticed by having a uh, an efficiency mindset. Um, I've been able to be more productive than other other people, and um, I'm noticing with Bitcoin that there's uh, uh, less loss of energy because people understand the the value when they transact it, and uh, they understand that it uh, it takes something of quality to be uh, to convince somebody to spend it, spend it on something, um, and um, it isn't like a it's it, it isn't like uh, uh, the the way fiat behaves. It's more like a like a flow. It's uh, um, um, something that is uh, constantly exchanged, and um, it doesn't it doesn't allow for efficiency. It 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 allows for um, a, a margin to be chased. Uh, margin to to fall off of production um and um i think bitcoin 
is something that changes people's choices so that people become aware of what whatever they're wasting and um, um, especially time so it starts with time and then all yep. uh, all other forms of energy that they that they have so waste productivity is uh, in, you're incentivized to use to, to recapture uh, uh, your your waste whether it's energy or um, things that have cost energy to produce um i think it's i think it's about um understanding the mind f mindset of efficiency and i think once people really understand this that a, just a whole new way of develop developing uh, starts to exist for people and um uh i think this is the the sort of next renaissance that uh, bitcoiners uh, pr predict and I, I think it's because of efficiency that people ha get the uh, the idea that uh, things can be de can be done better and uh, more efficiently yeah i think how like how i think about it is the most inefficient thing people are doing now is trading their finite time or finite energy expenditure in time for a reward that can be created infinitely right uh, the fact that when you have a job or a venture and you expend time and energy to get rewarded um when you come home and you understand that your reward is being devalued every year that you have to mitigate that risk in some sense so even take more risk right next to the risk you take with your job or your venture the fact that you have to mitigate that is already a very inefficient thing so you have you, you have to spend even more time and energy to protect time and energy that you already spent you know it's it's a uh, like just just only that situation i think is something that i really think about and also want to be more vocal or coherent about to show people like this, this is what you're already doing and um yeah i agree with that like what once you can be rewarded in the hardest money to ever exist then you also have to do more you, you have to put in more effort or be better at what you do to actually um be eligible to receive that reward right because the people that will pay you um know that this is the hardest money to ever exist and so they are looking for real value so i think it will help people to actually discover what it is that they are meant to be contributing to to society you know whatever that is from being a doctor to baking bread or whatever like doesn't really matter everyone has his function, his or her function in in society. I also believe that if we have a, a better reward for the human action, then the human action will be more efficient and more valuable um, because of that. Yeah, people just tend to tend to make choices, individual choices that lead to collective choices that uh, create uh, a abundance and innovation it's just when when considering time i see so many people just make the mistake of going for security which is a um, false representation of uh, uh, of efficiency and um, what people do to negate um, um, what people do to battle their um, their fears and to choose for what they see as security, for example, getting a job. For me, getting getting a job was never never an option because I I understood that it was a complete uh, sell off of my time, and uh, I understood the the moment I was um, supposed to go work become productive that i had only two choices one was do nothing and be happy with nothing or um become 
productive myself and uh, embrace the insecurity that it gives. But hmm. the the security that a job gives you is a false sense of security because there's nothing secure about a job. Right now, uh, billions of people have a... Um, are so, so incorporated in their security system of uh, working working for a steady stream of income and um, uh, having saved for a pension, but they don't know what keeps that into place, and they have no guarantees because this this system can can collapse, and uh, the result is that uh, you've worked for nothing all your life. Um, and even um, somebody at the end of, uh, of their career um, in in the Netherlands, for example, if you if you die and uh, you've saved all your career, then you've not only paid uh, thirty to fifty percent taxes. So let, let's say you're, you've been a uh, you've been well off and you've had a really good job in the Netherlands. Uh, you've been paid you've been paying fifty percent taxes for for all all your career. That's fifty percent gone. And you have no say of what what the government does with that money, and then um forty percent of that over for forty year period is also gone because of inflation and then um your son or daughter inherits your savings, and then the state takes another eighteen percent yeah so whatever whatever security you went for was immediately and you could calculate this beforehand you already know that if you start start doing this then you're wasting first 50 then then 40 and uh and then another 18 percent of your savings is is going to be gone and and then you you haven't even accounted for what might go wrong in your life that uh that the money then would be spent on so what are you giving your children it's just a lot of wasted a lot of wasted energy and most most parents who make this decision consciously out of a sense false sense of security are not only spending their own time they're also spending the time they sp- they could spend on their kids so this is also a, a something that i a conscious decision that i made i wanted to be there for my son he needs to he needs to have me in his life. He needs to have me around in his life, and I can't be, I can't be gone forty hours a week. I cannot. I have to be there to pick him up from school. I have maybe twenty-five hours to completely work on something to engulf myself in. That's the yeah. time. That's the time he spent at school. That's the time I have to spend for on work stuff that I believe in, and that doesn't mean that I'm always in his face when he is free. No, but I want to be there when he looks up and he has a question. He, I want him to find me. I want him to know where I am so that he can reach me. Yeah, and I think this time is. Um, what people are deprived of without them making any conscious des- decision about it. I see so many of my friends, they work, they work, they work, uh, both parents work and, um, and they're not even saving. They're just wage earners going paycheck to paycheck and their kids are being raised by somebody else. And this is something I saw when I, when I was, a lot younger i saw it i saw it before me this is where this is where it's going and this is this is the thing that i need to battle this is the thing that i need to solve for myself uh, and and uh, i feel i feel strong and affirmed that i was able to do it even if even in a fiat co- uh, economy hmm. this is the, the thing that most investors talk about or mo- most entrepreneurs talk about there is still the we still have the ability to do something of value in this fiat economy and to create value and get a really good return for it. But that is 
that is productivity. And um, I think it takes a conscious decision to accept that any any form of security that is given to you and not arranged by yourself is a is a forfeit. Is a it's a false sense of security. Yeah, that's a very good point. I've talked about this a lot on the podcast. Like I call it uh, outsourcing your responsibility, <laughs> basically, <laughs> right? And and that's we do that in different ways. And of course, this podcast is about Bitcoin, and we talk a lot about Bitcoin. But if you outsource your money, basically, and how you are rewarded for spending your time and energy, that is the main, like the root cause of everything that comes after that right any decision in your life where to live uh, build a family or you know a job venture whatever um that is that is what influences the the rest of what what people do um in their life so how how do you see um like the whole cbdc uh idea you sent me cbdc's are a ledger that's it no room for commercial banks no distribution of power or consensus no democracy like how how do you see this happening we are of course in europe i see at least in america some states are like they have some pushback even jerome powell said something about uh no uh, no cbdc so i think it's a different uh different kind of battle over there but uh in europe it feels like uh, we are going that way although the ecb says uh, this is not a savings uh vehicle which i find interesting because that's one of the characteristics of money but uh yeah what, what are your ideas there so the the difference between the fed and the ecb is that the fed doesn't have a plan for it yet uh, uh they're not open about it at least and the ecb is uh, is open about the cbdc they're going to forward they're they're going for it with it it's going to be in place i think it's uh, late 2026 they'll have the digital euro hmm. but like ev- like every uh shitcoin um if you if you don't solve the bitcoin trilemma then you're either going to end up with something that is centralized or something that is insecure and there is only one balance to do this correctly and that is the way bitcoin, bitcoin behaves so bitcoin as a protocol is in perfect balance between scalability decentralization and uh and security and if yeah. you, if you want to compromise for w- one of these traits to get to scale better then you get lightning which has less security or liquid which has less decentralization or um federated mints which are less de- decentralized um, so those are compromises that you can make and compromises you can't make on the base layer. That's the whole point of, of having a base layer that is fixed yeah. and, and uh, there is enough in incentive to keep this this way. And uh, as, long as, as long as the hash rate keeps going up, I have confidence that Bitcoin will manifest in this way. Um, but um, a CBDC... Uh, doesn't have a balanced uh, answer to the Bitcoin trilemma. So the CBDC will always be just a central ledger. And um, if you understand what a central ledger is, that is something completely different from uh, what commercial banks have. Commercial banks have accounts and that's a decentralized ledger. It's not distributed decentralized it's not in a in a beautiful way uh, decentralized but there is no central control over what is what amount is in which account mm. and um this is also the reason why it's so so good for fraud there are many ways to have your bookkeeping because it's only double entry bookkeeping um to be done creatively so that um your your bookkeeping 
doesn't have to match my bookkeeping. So if we if we keep sending each other invoices with fiat, there's there's no centralized way to control uh, who owns what. Um, yeah. I can have a different bookkeeping, and that that sort of needs to match. And the 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 Dutch tax authority will accept discrepancies. And they will accept it because they have no control over it. Yeah. And this is something that a CBDC can can solve. And this is this is also why the central central bank, the ECB, wants wants this. And um, then the another another consequence of this is if they have a central ledger and all the accounts are with the ECB, then what is a commercial bank? It doesn't need to exist anymore. So what are they what are they getting rid of? And I say they, central banks, what are central banks getting rid of at the moment? That's what I think is happening right now with the higher rates. They're getting rid of commercial banks and they're not gonna bail out the commercial banks. And that's why I'm I'm also not con uh conclusive about what the Fed is doing. I think they have a new secret man mandate and that is to to get to a point where they have their new world order where they have they their new um money for the for the world um which which is a cbdc a central a central ledger com, uh controlled by one uh one single authority and the the problem um that happens is that this is just another uh policy and yeah. what uh, what I think is laughable about it is if you do this and Bitcoin doesn't exist, then you still don't have a foolproof way to to um, to treat something like um, uh, the exchange of gold. There will always be a search for people to deal with the economic circumstance circumstances that they wished. Uh, they had a better store of value or a better uh, means of exchange to solve the situation they're in. And if you if you present people with a true worthless money, like a CBDC, the first people to notice are the entrepreneurs, and they're going to stop. They're going to stop asking for that as a payment. Yes. And there is no way to keep this economy rolling with a CBDC, there's just and, and I say this I say this with with certainty, out of conviction. Maybe maybe this is an ideology, but um, I think it isn't. I think uh, based on empirical evidence of uh, uh, st studying um, money systems uh, of of the of the past, we can see that. There has never been the installment of a of a of a non-backed currency, and um, um, a currency doesn't need intrinsic value; it just needs to be backed by something when when installed. And um, um, in the case of Bitcoin, it is proof of work, and uh, also proof proof of verification. Yeah, value. But it's just a provable, being provable, verifiable. In general, yeah, so verifiable it has it has uh, value propositions that match its its value, and exactly. uh, and a CBDC will, will not ha be able to do that for itself. The um, um, the dollar at the moment is decoupled from oil for a large part and it's in transition to becoming worthless and um the only thing that keeps the dollar of any value as a means of exchange is confidence so at the moment the fear the, basically well well yeah it's it's also just that people ha walk around with bills in their pocket or a number on their bank account, and they know they know it's redeemable for what uh, what the price tag is. This is this is confidence. The people have confidence that their value is stored over at least a, uh, a long enough time for them to spend it. But if yeah. this changes, then the car, the house of cards falls, and um, and if you then try to 
uh, bill in the people with a uh, CBDC to come in to be the savior of the economy with a CBDC, it's only a matter of time that the people um, don't see that the ball is actually not rolling anymore. Yeah, and um, and that's going to be a disaster. So if they do this, I think it's 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 going to be a disaster. Yeah. Well, I said fear because it's hard to uh, accept that it that the money is not real, right? That what you see in your bank account is not is not um, actually actually there. That's kind of why I said fear. But but yeah, it's it's still that uh, trust, right? But the verifiability, I think, is the main part. And as you said, uh, I like that about you know CBDC is just another another policy. But you cannot verify it. Like it's again. All talk, no walk, right? Where in Bitcoin, it's the verifiability that at least gives you more information on making a decision if you should trust it for, you know, your um, option to save your energy. And I think that's it. Like it is... It is advertised in a certain way, but you can also verify it for yourself, right? And every other form or type of money, same as the CBDCs, it's only advertised, right? When you see people talk about it, it's like, it's going to be more inclusive. It's just, uh, you know, cash, but digital. It's just, it's all talk. It's, it's, there's no options to actually verify it and make a conscious choice whether you should adopt it or not. And I think that is um, what Bitcoin constantly shows. I mean, it's the same with the halving, right? The halving is just like, hey, this is the monetary policy is advertised. See, it's still working. I think that is what what it shows, yeah. right? And, and that, every four year, every yeah. four years it does. And that doesn't need marketing. Whereas a CBDC no. is going to be heavily marketed into, exactly. into the yeah. market it needs to. Yeah. Being well, if you have in. to, if you have to, I told my son this. Like uh, we were sitting in the car, and he heard a commercial. He's like, "Is it what they say? Is, tr- is it true what they say?" <laughs> I said, "Well, if you have to make uh, advertisement for it, uh, probably not. You know, that's not totally true. But I love to instill that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, uh, yeah. Well, to uh, to round it up, because I have to pick him up uh, from school. You know, I ask everyone." You know, what is a core belief you will never let go? And you already sent me (laughs) the following. (laughs) I don't have a belief or I try to get rid of beliefs. Ideology is becoming redundant. I have plausible outcomes and crazy ideas. And I can switch between all that without being married to any of it. I think we talked about this a lot already. But I do want to ask you, there must be something you adhere to or, or practice that you find valuable in your life. Um, I think uh, I could answer that with my f- my faith in humans. Even though I can see that you- humans have a good in them, I see it in in the way people look at each other and the way people treat each other. If they have abundance, they will treat each other really nicely, and um, uh, I think. But I think if I have an ideology, it is my faith in mankind. Great ending. <laughs> Thanks, man. Love that we finally recorded something. Uh, I will link to your ex profile, Noster profile, in the show notes so uh, people can follow you and your thoughts. And uh, I think I see you in a few days. We go for lunch. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thank awesome, you, man. too, for talking to me. Awesome, man. Talk soon. (laughs) See ya. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.